So the environment and the woods here are really different than where I was on Cunede, Great Slave Lake, in the Northwest Territories, but there are some similar components. So what I'm looking for is branching sticks that have one thicker piece that's gonna be my vertical, and then with a side branch coming off at an angle so that it forms a little hook. All right. So this is a good one right here. It's a straight, sturdy looking branch with a little side shoot here. And I could use the saw on my Leatherman, but my knife is gonna be just as efficient here. This isn't the knife that I had out there with me. It's one that is modeled off of a similar knife and hand forged by a good friend of mine. So it is my favorite knife, and I've got some videos related to this that I will be getting up eventually. So how long the stake is gonna be is gonna depend on how much tension you need it to hold, and that's gonna to relate to the size of the critter that you're catching. Um, and it's also going to relate to how deep the soil is. So if it's shallow soil, then you don't need a long stake. So in the Arctic, most of mine were no more than like here, like 18 inches or so, because I wasn't gonna be finding any soil that was much deeper than that. And even that was hard to come by. So, but I'm gonna go right around here for this one. And then I'm gonna cut another one that's gonna match this pretty well. So what I'm using here today is dug fir, but in the Arctic, I was mostly using willow. There was a lot of willow around and it was mostly dead. So it was really easy to work with. Usually I could snap the branches off with my hand and then just use my knife to sharpen the ends and to uh, kind of refine my hooks a bit. So here are my two uprights, both with nice hooks there and both similar length and with a nice sharpened end. So now I want a nice straight cross piece and how long that's gonna be is gonna depend on where I'm trying to set it, how wide the trail is. So, and sometimes it's more about where I can actually drive these than how wide the trail is. And sometimes you just have to adapt to what the situation gives you. But this is a good piece. All right, there's my set. Okay, so the next important component of setting your trap is, of course, location. So out there, I was always looking for well-used game trails and not just trails themselves, but trying to find a spot where my set was going to blend into the background really well. So areas where there were already low-hanging branches were really nice or where there was something else kind of distracting, like a boulder nearby or an area that was easily brushed in. So an area like this with a lot of brush is a key area. However, the trick is in a lot of those areas, you don't necessarily have that springy sapling. So this is an area that I have a lot of branches and this was, would be a good area to use a rock as a weight as opposed to a sapling for your tension. So let's go ahead and put together this trap and I will look for a good rock and show you how I went about hanging rocks. So the trick is having the sticks able to hold the right amount of tension, but also having them be equal heights and having enough tension that your animal can still release that snare. So if you have a really heavy weight or a really, really tight, tightly sprung sapling, then that's gonna be more force than a rabbit or certainly a squirrel can actually pull and release. So it's a fine balance between enough tension and not too much tension. There, another big component was not so much tension that it was gonna pull my stakes right up and out of the ground. That was certainly a big issue. So here is my cross piece. So I would carve a flat spot at either end of my stick 
just the right distance between my pieces. And then I would put just a little bit of a divot where the point of my stakes was going to be. So that was just enough to keep it in place when under tension, but light enough that the weight of the animal could pull it. Now I'm going to go look for the right sized rock. Okay, I've got a good sized rock. So I'm going to make a cradle for that out of paracord. And I found that while it was tempting to want to use a lot of paracord to make a more elaborate tie for it, usually one or two loops around was really the best way to go. And the ideal rock was going to be one that was kind of narrow on one side and bigger on the other so that I could do just one loop and be really conservative with my resources. That said, I also used peeled paracord a lot of the time, and I will tell you more about that in another video demonstrating the peeling of paracord. So just a simple loop tied with a lark's head knot right here with a knot at the end, which is similar to what Morris Kohansky calls the Canadian jam knot, only that's with an overhand knot with an overhand, and this is a lark's head, but both very effective. So now I'm going to put this rock up and over the close branch. And can you see it there? Ah, there it is. All right. So I'll dangle it so it's in the frame. So here is my rock. That's my mechanism. And basically as high up as the rock is off of the ground, that's how high up the rabbit will be off of the ground. And while I think it's tempting to do these really high sets or really strong weighted poles, I was actually more successful with the ones that weren't whipping the rabbit up and off of its feet because that could potentially break my fishing line. It's just 20 pound test and that quick action could snap it. And also I think that it was easier on the rabbits and they didn't struggle as much. So now I get the correct height. And again, I was all about a simple lark's head with an overhand knot. So a lark's head is basically like a square knot, only it's a square knot under tension. So I'll show you here. So the lark's head looks like that. This isn't a knot tying video that would just take too darn long. So you can look that up. There's a lot of other knots that would work well, but this was what I used. Okay. So my weight in place at the proper height, hanging here and my cross piece set up just so. And I all right, so there is my set, my weight mechanism here. The one thing that's missing, of course, is my noose. All right, so here is my setup. You can see my cross piece right here. So then I would use my 20 pound test fishing line, which is just not all that strong, people. But what you're gonna do, it is what I had. So then I would tie that off with basically a good square knot and then a couple overhand knots as well. And you have to be kind of careful because if you tug on this too tight, then of course you're gonna be releasing the spring mechanism. So this is to emulate a rabbit set and you're gonna have a hard time seeing my loop of course because it's fishing line, it's clear, but we'll do the best we can and uh, maybe I'll demo somewhere else that's a little bit brighter and then you'll just imagine that it's here. So for a rabbit snare, the basic, basic rule of thumb is fist high from the ground and the snare loop fist in diameter. So fist high loop that is fist high from the ground. So I am measuring out my fishing line nipping it off 
Now, out there I was using a combination of my knife and my Leatherman for all of my trapping, and I will show you how the Leatherman was so important as we go on here. So, fist high off of the ground, and then a fist high around, and then I would just use a simple overhand knot I cut my thumb yesterday, and this is perfect because I had pretty deep cracks in my thumbs once the weather started getting really cold out there, so I had bandages on my fingers a lot, and uh, this is super accurate how it was. So I would do one overhand knot to make the top of the loop, and then I would do another overhand knot a few inches down, and that second knot served both as security, so it would make sure that that sucker was gonna cinch down tight and not be a knot that could easily be broken. And that also felt like it gave a little bit of rigidity to my loop. So this is now fist high off the ground and a fist high loop. And here is where the Leatherman comes in. And you gotta really kind of kink the fishing wire because it has this natural spring to it that does not want to take a shape for you, which is part of why fishing line is ever so much more challenging than snare wire to work with. Now is where the superpower comes in, and that is these lovely long brown and white hairs that I've got. So when it was snowy, I would tend to go for the white hairs, and when there was a brown background, I would go for the brown hairs, and I would take one hair, and they were ridiculously difficult to see. And I'm out of practice now. Let me tell you, I got very good at tying fine knots with my own hair out there. In the Arctic, where it was well below freezing for most of my time, crouching in the snow, working with minuscule hairs, <sighs> <laughs> with my fingers very cold and remarkably underfed, you can see it was a little challenging. Oh, and look at this. My rock has, oh, the rock pulled it right out of the ground, which is a great example because that is a common occurrence when you're setting traps. You move a little bit and all of a sudden something shifts. And uh, yeah, here is your trap up in the air having broken the hairs that you so painstakingly tied on there because that's the whole point of the hairs, right? Partly it's that they are so fine and hard to see for the critters, but also it's partly that they're so weak that the rabbit can easily break them, right? So you want it held tight enough that it stays in the middle of the trail, but not so tight that the rabbit can't break and pull the mechanism out. So my practice was one hair tying this loop to one side, one to the other side, and then to keep it exactly in the middle of the trail, a third hair down to the bottom tied to a stick that I would then bury down into the snow. So it was really well held in every angle. And then the trick was, as you can see this right here, my mechanism and my rock. Then the trick was to brush in the sides to direct the rabbit right here. Because if there's no obstructions to either side, then the rabbit, when it sees something foreign in the trail, might decide to just go to one side or the other. The key is having just enough brushy stuff that it's inconvenient for the rabbit to go to one side or the other, but not so much brushy stuff that it's thinking, wait, something is fishy here, this isn't right. I'm turning around. So all a very delicate balance and a nuanced understanding of what the rabbit behavior is going to be and doing your very best to stay two steps ahead of them, which is tricky when it's their natural environment and you're a foreigner there. So, oh my goodness, such a rich, rich learning experience. Whew. So here is the completed snare with a rock weight as the lifting mechanism. So I've got two uprights with hooks and then a straight cross piece tied with paracord to a rock that is up and over this here branch. 
and then dangling from the cross piece in the middle of the trail, fist high and fist big around, a loop of 20 pound test fishing line. That's not what I'm recommending. It's just all I had out there. Snare wire would be much nicer. And then that is held because it's fishing line, therefore not rigid, loose and floppy, held to either side of the snare set up by pieces of my own hair. So held taut to either side and then one more stick tied with a hair that is pushed down into the ground to hold it exactly in the middle. So that is my rock weighted snare mechanism. Thanks so much for watching everyone. Please subscribe to my channel. And if you're interested in learning more about what I do and ways to learn from me, check out my website, www.buckskinrevolution.com. Also, if you really like what I'm doing and want to support it, please check out my Patreon profile and consider supporting me through that platform. It makes a huge difference in the content and the quality of the content that I can put out into the world, and you get all kinds of wonderful benefits as well. Thanks, folks, and thanks for joining me in the Buckskin Revolution.